good to see you here. Good looking crowd this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good today. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. <laughs> it's good to be back and we are excited and delighted that you have been invited. You may be wondering what, on world, what in the world am I doing here this morning, uh, but the Lord has a plan for you. Uh, we've got a good worship service uh, lined up for you, and we're just praying that the Lord's Holy Spirit will fill this place. I've been praying that the Lord will send people uh, who are ready to do business with him today, and it sounds like you are ready to do that. So uh, without any further ado, I want to say welcome. My name is Tracy Smith. I'm pastor here. If you're visiting this morning or if it's been a while since you've been here, we ask that you take one of the visitor information cards and fill it out. You'll find those located in the back of the pew directly in front of you. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, that's something we want to know about as well. How can we be praying for you? Uh, we have a prayer guide that we go over on Wednesday nights. We have time uh, specifically to pray over those needs that come in. Uh, we discuss what's going on, answer prayers. We always give praise reports. So hopefully you'll be a part of one of those prayer meetings in the near future. That's Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We have a brief Bible study. We're going through the book of Deuteronomy right now. Uh, tonight we have a very, very special uh, opportunity to hear uh, firsthand of what's going on around the world. I, I hope that you'll make plans to be here at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, our very own Joycelyn Slayton from here uh, at First Baptist Church got the opportunity to go to Peru uh, to be a part of a team that works with Operation Christmas Child. As you know, we've been uh, involved with that ministry for many, many years not too many times do we have the opportunity to have boots on the ground in places where the boxes are actually distributed. We've had people that go to the distribution centers here in America, but I don't think we've had anybody go foreign or abroad on a team like that. So she's going to bring a presentation tonight and just share firsthand of her experience with that. I've already seen some of the pictures that she has sent to me, but she'll have a PowerPoint that she'll go through, and I'm going to just turn the whole service over to you. She's invited people from other churches that are involved in Operation Christmas Child as well. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to be here tonight and not miss out on that. Uh, several other things to note in the bulletin. Uh, we have one more mat-making class that Miss Jane Bennett is uh, hosting on June 29th here in the Fellowship Hall from 10 to noon. Uh, that's Saturday, June the 29th. You don't have to bring anything, just show up. She's going to teach you how to take plastic shopping bags, prepare them, tie them together, and then crochet them or knit them into a, they can be used as either a blanket or a mat. You can see one of those out in the foyer. So don't dispose of your shopping bags. Bring them here. Uh, we'll recycle them. We'll put them to good use. If you're interested in taking part in that ministry, we plan on sending them to New Orleans to some people that are involved in a homeless ministry there in the city. And uh, we're just absolutely excited about her teaching that. She's taught many people in this area, not just here at this church, but other churches as well. So help us to get the word out on that. If you know somebody in another church that would like to start a ministry like this and they need to learn how to do it, tell them to be here next Saturday. So make sure you check your bulletins with everything that's going on. Uh, we're still following up from Vacation Bible School. Uh, we still have many contacts to make from that, but we're counting on you to go out and share with others what's going on here at First Baptist Church. If you're not involved in any way, shape, or form, there's a place for you to serve here. There's also small groups available for everyone here. 9.30 on Sunday mornings, uh, we have children's ministry, we have a nursery, we have student ministry, we have senior adult ministries. We're hoping to open up another uh, young adults, young couples class uh, before the fall. Uh, school semester starts. So if you're interested in being involved in one of those, if you want to learn what the teachers do, how they prepare, uh, if you want to coordinate one of those classes and be involved, let us know so we can get you plugged in in that area. So the book of Psalm 145 verses 17 through 18 says this, it says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all, all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. So if you're distant from the Lord right now, if you're not as near as you know you need to be, he's just a cry away. He's just a prayer away. 
And that's what this service is developed to do. That's what this service is designed to do. That's what we prepare to do is find a way to help you draw closer to the Lord, whether it be through song, scripture, preaching, teaching, Sunday school classes, whatever the case may be. If you feel like your relationship is not where it needs to be with the Lord, or if you've never stepped into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're hoping that something during the course of this service will bring you to that point. So let's all stand. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Father God, what a great day this is. I'm so thankful for these that are here in attendance, Lord God, prepared and ready to worship you. But Lord, all is vain unless the Holy Spirit fills this place. Unless you come down, Lord God, and just dwell upon your people, just like I read, Lord God, we want to call upon your name so that you will draw near to us. Lord, we want to feel your presence. We want to worship you. We want to sing praises to you. We want your Holy Spirit just to re-energize us and prepare us for what lies ahead in our lives. Lord, none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. None of us know what's going to happen in this service. None of us know what's going to happen with the rest of this day. But we know somebody who does, and his name is Jesus Christ. He has our lives in his hand. He has our future in store. He has everything in our lives mapped out. So I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself to us today in a way that we've never experienced. And we just ask it all in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Find somebody you haven't said hello to yet. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Hug a hand, shake a neck, however you want to do it, and just tell them how glad you are to see them here today. Would you join us as we sing, serve the Lord with gladness.
you so much. And you know, scripture does say in Psalm 100, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, enter his courts with praise. Know ye that not that he is the Lord our God. Listen, let's get excited about this. Let's get excited. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35, the scripture says, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning. My footnote in, in my Bible when I was looking at this verse says that there is no place for slothfulness. You know what that is? Laziness, inactivity, uh, not doing what God wants you to do. It says there's no place for that in the service of God's people who are waiting for his return. Amen? Amen. Amen? The bottom line is to the work. We are called to the work, to the work. We are servants of God. Are you doing something? Don't be slothful. Let's sing to the work. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, the scripture says, Those who have served well, again, an excellent standing and great assurance is their faith in Christ Jesus. Are you serving well? Listen, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to serve. It, it may not be from the pulpit. It may not be in the choir, even though we'd like to have you. It may not be, listen, it might be clean in a Sunday school room, but we all have an opportunity 
to serve. And the bottom line is, give of your best to the master. This is our offertory. Would you stand? Serve you in spirit and truth. 
Lord, we thank you for the one that you have sent to bring us the message you have in store for our hearts and our conscience. Prepare them, Lord, so we can receive the great blessings you have for us this day. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray for the unconcerned and the loss of this community, Lord. We pray for our sick of this community, Lord. Our nation is it's in the turmoil that it's in this day. Lord, we're going to leave it in your hand. Our Heavenly Father, just take these offerings for your benefit. We ask it in thy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Well, church, can you say amen this morning? It is good to be back. It is good to be with you. Thank you for uh, all the prayers. Thank you for all the birthday wishes. Uh, thank you for being here and just continuing to do what you've been doing, uh, reaching others with the gospel, letting others know about the ministries here at First Baptist Church. And we are excited about getting back on our path to discipleship. We've been going over that for several weeks now. We've been using the Donald Whitney book, uh, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Many of you have purchased a copy of that. You've been going through that. Uh, we've kind of pretty much stuck to his uh, pattern that he goes through chapter by chapter. And uh, if you haven't gotten a copy of the book, if you know somebody that does, I really encourage you to get a copy or borrow it and read through the chapter that we're going to be discussing today. We've discussed many different topics, some you are familiar with, some you wanted more information on. Uh, we've covered personal spiritual disciplines of Bible intake, scripture memorization, prayer, fasting, worship, and evangelism. I, I hope that you are putting those into practice because they do you absolutely no good just to have a head knowledge of them and not actually apply them to your life. We're going to be going back and covering some of these specifically uh, in future sermons, I plan on teaching you uh, a method of evangelization that you can use with just a piece of paper and a pencil. You can walk someone through uh, the plan of salvation. We'll be covering that next. We only have just a few more personal spiritual disciplines to cover in this study. Uh, we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, the topic that we cover today is just as vital to your worship as anything else that we've covered. All these other personal spiritual disciplines, they are important, but I think this one is just as equally as important. We often don't relate serving to worship. Most of the times when you hear the word serve, you think of that dirty four-letter word, work. <laughs> At least most people do anyway. But let me just say this, serving the Lord goes much more further than just manual labor. But there does come a time and a place where a follower for Jesus Christ, a true disciple, has to take what God has blessed them with, their gifts, their talents, their resources, and them into what God is doing in his kingdom building process. So the question on the floor is this, what are you doing right now with what God has blessed you with to further advance his kingdom? How are you serving the Lord at this moment? And so Joshua chapter 24, probably one of the most well-known verses on serving. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's making a proclamation over what he and his family intend to do. And that word serve there in that chapter used in its context actually means worship. And when you follow through the Old Testament on into the New Testament, especially what we're talking about today, your service to the Lord is a very, very vital part of your worship each and every day. And so in Joshua 24, when he talks about as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the word serve is actually used at least 14 different times in that one chapter alone, depending on what translation you use. So this past, uh, the past few weeks, we've been uh, kind of reeling down from vacation Bible school uh, our theme was Breaker Rock Beach. We were talking about the rock solid truth of God's word. And with the key verse we learned during VBS week was Romans 12.2. It says to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. I want to back up to what Romans 12.1 says. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, God, which is your reasonable service. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today. What is your reasonable service to the Lord? In Romans 12, 1, Paul is talking about laying your body down, laying your life down, and using it as an offering to the Lord and for his service. When you talk about the path of discipleship that we're on right now, Jesus talks specifically about what followers of his should do. He talks specifically about the commitment level of a follower of his. In the book of Luke, Jesus says, Any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit 
for the kingdom of God. He's talking about a disciple being on that path, putting his plow, uh, his hands to the plow, and performing work. He's breaking ground. He's sowing seed. He's doing things to promote God's kingdom each and every day, and he's not looking back on the commitment that he's made. When we first started this study, we talked about Jesus saying that if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. Being a disciple has a lot to do with serving the Lord. With your time, with your gifts, with your talents, with your resources. Not just on Sunday morning either. Let me tell you, what goes into a church service on Sunday morning? We don't just wake up on Sunday morning and say, hey, let's, let's pick a few songs, let's pick a sermon topic, let's pray about the people that will be. No, we, we start on Monday morning. I mean, the first thing they want to know from me is, hey, what are you preaching on this Sunday? <laughs> let's start getting ready for it. And then all of our services, all of our gifts, all of our talents begin coming together. The bulletin that you see in your hand, the restrooms have to be cleaned, the floors have to be cleaned, all the uh, cards have to be put out in the pews. People take their service seriously around here and get ready for Sunday morning. But the question on the floor is, what are you doing right now in God's kingdom building process, and specifically in this body of believers, to serve the Lord? We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. I could have meant, went to many different places uh, to study about and to talk about. But I think as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you really want to become like your master, Jesus, I think you have to be like-minded as him. You have to understand what his thought process was here while he was here on this earth. But I also think you have to work in conjunction with other believers as well. That song that we just sang, man, it, the, the opening part of this passage, it plays in it so perfectly. One heart, one vision, one purpose to glorify God. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. The overarching theme of the book of Philippians is the concept of joy. It's kind of ironic that the apostle Paul wrote about joy from a prison. <laughs> Would you be able to do that? Would you be able to encourage someone, maybe another church member, during a dark time of your life in a situation that you really didn't intend on being in. So as you read through this, as Paul is encouraging the church at Philippi, just think about the context, where he's writing it from, what's going on in his own life, and what is he trying to do for this church that he's writing to. Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, he says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. If you really want to serve the Lord, the best way that you can serve the Lord is by serving someone else. By serving someone who is in need, by serving someone you see is struggling, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, don't just look out for your own self. Don't be conceited. Don't be self-centered. He said, look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then he moves into the mind of Christ. He says, your thinking has got to change. If you really want to serve the Lord, you have to have a renewal of your mind. Verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of a man and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth 
and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody should be saying amen right there to the glory of God the Father. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, what a powerful passage we just read. And I just pray, Lord God, that those words would leap off the pages and sink deep into our hearts, Lord. As we explore the mind of Christ, his thought process, his attitude, and what he did while he was here on this earth, Lord God, if we are to be true followers of Jesus, let us be imitators of Christ in this very way. As we explore the concept of how we can serve, how we can serve others, Lord God, I pray that you'll expand our knowledge in the area, but I pray also that you will give us heart's desires to follow you in ways that we never have before. I pray that you'll speak through me, Lord God, the things that need to be said, that you'll hold my tongue, Lord God, when there's something that doesn't need to be said, and that you'll show us through these motivators that we're about to study what it means to truly serve the Lord and to serve each other. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in Donald Whitney's book, he actually gives many different motivators for serving as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at six in specific because I think they fit well into this passage that we just looked at. The first motivator for serving is gladness. Can you serve with gladness? Does it bring joy to your heart when you are able to serve other people? Write down this verse, Psalm chapter 100, verse 2. The psalmist writes, Serve the Lord with gladness. When you serve, is it grudgingly? When you serve, do you dread it? Or when you serve, does it bring joy to your heart knowing that you have been used by God to accomplish something for his kingdom? I love during vacation Bible school, we go back in the kitchen area. The kitchen area turns into a fellowship hall. There's cutting up, there's laughter, there's joy. Nobody's getting on to each other. It's just, it blesses my heart to go in and see. And that's not the only place that I see it at. I, I see Sunday school classes where they're fellowshipping, they're cutting up, they're having a good time, but they're also learning how they can serve with their lives. Right here in the book of uh, Philippians, Paul is very intentional with his words. You see, words don't just say something. Words actually do something. And as he introduces this concept of serving the way that Jesus did, he says the first thing that you need to do when you begin serving God, when you begin serving in a body of believers, you've got to have the same thought process. You've got to have a renewal of your mind. You've got to be of one accord. We can't have everybody rowing in one direction and then there's one guy who's trying to row in the opposite direction. It kind of defeats the purpose. He says that he is encouraging them in every way to experience joy in their newfound faith in Christ. He says here that nothing will bring him more joy, and in essence, nothing will bring them more joy than to know that they are serving in one accord and being like-minded. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, words mean something, and when he says one accord and being of one mind, the actual Greek word used there is symsikos. It's where we get our word symphony from. It means harmonious. It paints a picture of souls that are beating together at the same pace. Souls that are in tune with Christ and with each other. So what does that have to do with serving with gladness? Well, I'm glad you asked. I've got something here that many of you are familiar with. If you've ever taken any kind of music lessons or if you've known a group that has worked together, you know that they have to be in tune and on beat at the same time. So they have these little devices. They have electronic devices now that help everybody keep beat. Some people like to hit on the downbeat. Some people like to hit on the upbeat. That's exactly the picture that the Apostle Paul is painting when he says to be in one accord. You're marching to the beat of the same drum. You're moving in the same direction. Everything is in tune. Nowadays they have electronic devices when there's a lot of noise and they can't really hear the drum as he's keeping beat. They have something that just goes tick, tick, 
music. It keeps everybody in the band on the same beat. We have a choir director that stands in front of us and makes sure that we come in on time. When the beat is right, when the music starts, Every now and then we have a long pause in something. You know you have to count for three beats and then start over again. It just keeps everybody in tune. It works so much better when everybody is on the same beat. But every now and then you get somebody who's a little bit off tune and it stands out. I can't read music very well. Sometimes I just belt it out and it doesn't sound good. I don't know whether you notice or not, but every now and then you're just, just a little bit out of tune, and those out of tune notes really stand out because they're doing something completely different than anyone else. But as long as everybody is marching to the same beat, we've got a goal in mind. We want to reach the lost. We want to make disciples. We want to make sure that everything is working in tune. That's the picture that the Apostle Paul is creating to be in one accord because he don't want anybody getting carried away and moving along to their own beat. Oh yeah, he's excited about that. Because <laughs> what happens? All the attention has been focused on this one person that's making more noise, kind of doing their own thing. They're defeating the purpose of everybody being on beat and in one accord. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is if you're out of tune with everyone else, if you're out of step with everyone else, you're not going to have as much joy when you're serving as if you would be serving right along beside with everyone else. When you serve, do you have a mindset of what you need to do? When you serve, do you have gladness? Does it bring joy to your heart when you're marching in beat with everyone else? Hey, we're going at the same pace. I'm not getting ahead. I'm not falling behind. They're teaching me how to do these jobs. They're teaching me how to serve. We are in one accord. We are like-minded. Back in 1937, there was an animated picture show that came out, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. There's a real popular song that Snow White talked to everybody in the house. The seven dwarves had left for the day. They had made a mess in the kitchen. There was plates and cups piled up. The house was a wreck. They weren't very good housekeepers. And she had all these little animals. There were deer and squirrels and birds. She said, you know what? I'm just going to get everybody to help clean this up. We're going to serve together. And the song was this, just whistle while you work. <laughs> everybody was happy. They got the job done. They were in tune. They were marching the beat of a same drum. And that little song right there was designed for many, many different things. It was designed to teach people to work together. It was designed to teach people to work with a positive attitude. And it was to teach people to work together when they have a common goal in mind. There were some guys I used to work with down at the plant. They would always gang up together. They would get a gang plan together. And I think someone in their family had taught them to get this saying. They said, uh, when we all work together, soon the work is done. And when we all work together, the work is so much fun. And when you serve the Lord, do you serve with gladness? Because if you cut against the grain, you're not going to have as good of a time. You're not going to have the same joy. You're not going to have the same unity. So one motivator for serving the Lord is gladness. It brings happiness. It brings joy, not just to me, but to others as well. Man, think about somebody who is in need. Think about somebody who has fallen down on their luck. If you serve them, do you bring them joy as well? Absolutely, you do. Someone cares for them. You put your gifts and talents to use, and you have ministered to that person. Another motivator for Serving as a disciple is obedience. When I serve the Lord, I'm being obedient to what he has called me to do. Verse 7 here in Philippians chapter 2, it says that he made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of a man. Jesus made of himself a bondservant. 
Like I said a minute ago, Paul is very intentional with his wording here in this word. Bond servant is the Greek word doulos, just a slave. Someone has been brought on to perform a specific job for a specific time and for a specific purpose. And the only thing they know to do is to obey their master. Donald Whitney in his book, he says that any true Christian would say that he or she wants to obey God, but we disobey when we do not actively serve him. And he point blank says that we sin when we refuse to serve God. This concept of a doulos, a servant, a slave, a bond servant, if that servant or that slave was to bow up to his master and say, you know what, I just don't feel like working a day, what do you think would happen to that servant? His life would probably end right at that point because he's not doing what his master has commanded him to do. And when you become a disciple, when you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't just have Jesus as the Savior of your life. He is the Lord of your life. What he says goes. You are under another authority. And that's why in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says you're to renew your mind. I'm no longer living for myself. I'm living for the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man is to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and obediently follow after me daily. Jesus made it clear when he was on this earth, did he not come to be served, but he came to to serve and to be a ransom for many. So as we're on this path of discipleship, the goal of a disciple is to become more and more like their master each and every day. And if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you're not obedient, obedient to what the Lord has commanded you to do, if you're just a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're in direct obedience. If you want to become more like Jesus, you've got to have the mindset and the heart of a servant as well. And obedience is one of the key motivators for you to accomplish that. The next motivator we see for serving as a disciple is humility. There's one thing for certain that we've learned about discipleship and the role of a mentor. The mentor teaches in many different ways but the most effective way is through demonstration. And here in verses 8 through 9, it says specifically that he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. Let me just tell you, as a follower, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a disciple of his, the way up, is down. The way to become exalted in his kingdom is to bow down in obedience and humility. Jesus said, he who exalts himself will be abased, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so Charles Swindoll wrote a very interesting book. Uh, this is another complimentary book that goes along with this topic. It's called Improving Your Serve. I love the name of it. And in that book, uh, he gives an outline of some things that keep us from being humble. He says, in today's world, we have somewhat of a pyramid, I, me, mine, and myself. But when you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're humbly following after him, those four words do not exist. Turn with me to John chapter 13, and we'll see the ultimate display of humility that Jesus made for his followers. Jesus had just finished washing the feet of his disciples. He knew that his end was near. He knew he was fixing to go to the cross. And in one last opportunity to show his disciples exactly what they were to do in his absence, after dinner, he put on a towel. He took a basin of water. And he washed all of the disciples' feet, sandy, dirty, stinky, smelly, 
Even the one that betrayed him, Judas Iscariot, Jesus washed his feet as well. And when he came to Simon Peter, Simon Peter said, oh no, you're not, there's no way you're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus wanted to prove to him exactly what true humility was. And when he finished washing the feet, uh, pick up with me in verse 10. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he sat down again. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In the ultimate act of service and humility, the creator of this world, the savior of this world, stooped down as a servant and did the lowliest stinkiest, most humble act that he could possibly do. And he says specifically, I did this as an example for you. Now, what I have done for you, you go and do others as well. Jesus made it clear that he did not come to be served, but to serve. God wants you to serve him. And there's many, many, many different ways that you can do that. He may not be calling you to wash the feet of someone else. That was something that was very, very specific back in that culture in that day and time. But the way he wants you to serve him is by serving others. So there's one warning I need to give to you about serving that goes in conjunction with humility, and it's this. Don't ever think that you're irreplaceable. Don't ever think that you do so much around here that there's no way that God will ever find a replacement for you. God was accomplishing his plan long before you got here. God has many other servants at his disposal that he can put in your place at any given moment. And Jesus said, I'm fixing to be absent. And when I'm gone, you're going to be doing what I just did as well. So do you serve with humility? Do you have a concept, do you have a mindset that I'm going to do anything that God calls me to do, no matter how stinky or dirty or nasty it seems? Stay humble as you serve. If you don't serve, God already has someone ready to do your job. You're going to miss out on that opportunity. And when you do serve, make sure you include others in what you are doing as well. When we all work together, the work is so much fun, and when we all work together, soon the work is done. Whether you prepare other people or not, whether you serve with other people and teach them and train them, God can still equip those people the same way that he equipped you as well. So when the apostles were arguing over who would sit with Jesus in his kingdom, in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus made this statement that motivated the entire group. He said, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. So these first three are very, very practical applications these first three seem to come somewhat naturally as you serve. The next three motivators for serving that we're going to cover, they all fall under the condition of grace. If you've experienced God's grace, and only if you've experienced God's grace, will you be able to experience these next three motivators, forgiveness, love, and gratitude. 
Verse number 10, why did Jesus come? And what motivates us to serve more than anything else? And I want to make one thing perfectly clear right here. There's no way you could ever work enough to repay God for what he's done for you. If you've experienced God's forgiveness, if you've experienced his God's grace, it comes as a free gift to you. The price for your salvation has already been paid with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins have been washed away, and you don't owe him anything. But when you have been forgiven, that should create inside of you something that says, you know, I just want to show my love for the Lord. He's forgiven me of my sins. He's made me a new person. He's given me a new life. I have been forgiven, and now what can I do to express my love to the Lord? You know, the, the best way that you can express your love towards another human being is by serving them. Most of the times we'll get in arguments with people. What do we want to do? We want to find a way to make up. Hey, I'm going to bring you some flowers. I'm going to give you some chocolates. I'm going to cook you supper. Let me give you a shoulder. I just want to show a way that I really am sorry for what happened. And when you experience God's forgiveness, it's the same way. You say, I, what can I do to express my love for the Lord? Donald Whitney also says on page 144, he says, when God calls his elect to himself, he calls no one to idleness. When we are born again and our sins are forgiven, the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience. And according, according to Hebrews 9.14, in order for us to serve the living God. See, some people have it all backwards. They truly believe that serving God equals forgiveness. If I can just do enough, then I can win God's forgiveness. If I can just work enough, then I'm going to get on God's good side. That's not the way it works. Some people think that they can just work their way right into heaven. Folks, if that was the case, then when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, it was in vain. But when Jesus died on the cross, your salvation was paid in full. And now you don't owe him anything. Some people have it all backwards. They truly believe that serving God equals forgiveness. But you really need to reverse that. Forgiveness equals serving the Lord. The fifth motivator, love. Verse 11 of Philippians chapter 2 says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you tell others about your love for the Lord? That's one way of serving right there. It's just by sharing your faith. Not actually toiling, not actually laboring, but speaking the name of Jesus, confessing his name. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my master. I serve him and serve him only. I have found salvation through his shed blood, and you can too. You see, we don't just need to serve each other here in our own little congregation. We need to serve those out in the lost community as well and show the love of Jesus in practical ways that they've never seen before. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, if you want to write this verse down. Paul says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Do you love God? I mean, do you really love God? Then where is the evidence? God hasn't called anyone to idleness. As Sylvia mentioned just a moment ago, God hasn't called anybody into slothfulness. But the genuine expression of your love for God will be evident in the ways that you serve him. Now we come to what I consider the greatest of all of these motivators for our service. When I think of how unworthy I am of everything that God has done for me, I, I want to find a way to express my appreciation. You know, when you realize how blessed we are to be a member of God's family and to be able to worship with other believers here in our congregation, there is no greater way 
for you to express your love for someone around you than by serving them. When someone in your Sunday school class is sick or going through a rough time, a hot meal, cleaning their house, taking care of their lawn, random acts of kindness, finding the simple ways of saying how appreciative you are of them. You just cannot put a price tag on those ways of serving. The last motivator we're going to talk about is gratitude. Do you serve the Lord out of a heart filled with gratitude? Write down this verse, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Samuel tells the people of Israel, he says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. And here's the motivator. For consider what great things he has done for you. If you're saved, if you know for sure that you're a child of God and heaven is your home, can you think of anything greater than that? Do you still remember how messed up your life was before you met Jesus Christ and he forgave you of your sins? Do you remember that? Do you remember how bad of a wreck your life used to be? And now what do you have? You have a home. You have a new life. You have a church family that cares for you and pray for you. Knowing that Jesus paid the ultimate price for your salvation there's no way that you could ever repay him for that. But when you bow down before him, and when you say, here I am, Lord, use me, send me, and show me what you want me to do, you are expressing gratitude for the debt that he has paid that you could never pay on your own. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the whole Bible, had this to say, the quotes on your outline. He says, The faithful servants of Jesus Christ are wont to prefer the public good to their own personal interests. Are you motivated to serve today? My heart is blessed because many different people have stepped up to help out in several different areas. We've come a long ways, but there is a lot left to do. We still have two main goals of reaching the lost and making disciples, but it's going to take everybody doing their part. The general rule of thumb when you get a group together is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I think we've kind of overcome that percentage just a little bit here. I, my heart was blessed to see so many new people serving during Vacation Bible School just a few weeks ago. My heart was blessed when I saw my wife down here in the congregation a while ago because someone else has stepped up to work in the sound booth and kind of relieved her of that duty. I see many different people doing a lot of different things, and I appreciate that. As your pastor, I love seeing you being able to plug in and get involved in God's kingdom building plan and what he's doing here at First Baptist Church. And I believe God is still raising up many laborers for the harvest. As you look upon our community here, Jesus said, look upon the fields, they're white with harvest. Pray that the Lord will send laborers for the harvest. There's still a lot of work left to do. There's still a lot of holes that need to be filled in many different departments here. There's something for each and every person to do. Whether it's sitting home, picking up the phone, calling and checking on people, no job is unimportant. And it takes everybody doing their part to accomplish what God wants to do here in this church. And if you're here today, God has you here for a reason as well. People have prayed for you. They prayed for your salvation if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you're distant from the Lord, they've been praying for you. And I see God raising up some people in these younger generations that want to come along beside you. We, we need to close that generation gap. We need to bring up some of these younger people to work along beside us and teach them and show them how to serve the Lord with gladness. But most importantly, we need to pray for those who are lost. Each and every day we come in contact with someone. 
And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there's nothing more I'd rather do than show you how to make that happen. If you've never stepped out in faith, if you're here today and you say, I don't know anything about this path of discipleship that you're talking about, but I want to know more. I feel the Lord's calling me to do something. I, I know that my life is a wreck right now. I know that I have nothing to do with the things of God, and I want that in my life. But if you're here today, there's a decision that you need to make. Number one, are you going to serve the Lord? But the most important decision that you'll ever make, where you'll spend eternity at. And I have so many people when I ask them that question, they say, Brother Tracy, I just, I don't know. And they're openly confessing that they know for sure <laughs> that heaven is not their home. So if you're here today and you don't know for sure where you'll spend eternity, In just a moment, I'm going to tell you how to do that. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As we get ready to enter into a time of invitation, Jesus came to this earth for one reason and for one reason only. He didn't come to call out servants. He didn't come to give you a job to do. He didn't come just to make us work and to labor and to toil. He came to set us free from the penalty of sin. He said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. We're all born with a sin nature. We're all born with our backs to God. And we are all born with a nature that goes in total opposition to the things of God. That's called a sin nature. Most of the times we think of sin as something that we do, some flagrant act that is disobedient to God, but sometimes sin is the things that we don't do as well. And the Bible clearly tells us that we've all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And that sin comes with the payment. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in a place called hell. That's what we all deserve. Every single one of us deserve that. And out of God's goodness and out of his grace and out of his mercy, he's made a way. 2 Peter 3.9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The first step on the path of discipleship, the first step of faith in becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is to admit that you have sin in your life. There's no need of a Savior until you realize that you need to be saved. The next step is to believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins. His death, burial, and resurrection were the sacrifice that was accepted by God for the sins of all mankind. And the Bible says that if any man is to believe in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things become new. When you acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, when you confess your sins to him, the Bible says God will make you a totally new creation. That's why we call it being born again. It's just like starting your life all over again. And it's as simple as calling out to his name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him, you will be saved. The ability to sin is still there, but when you are saved, you are saved from the penalty of sin. You no longer have to worry about consequences of sin. So if you've never made that decision, in just a moment when the music begins, when everyone stands and begins singing a hymn of invitation, 
I would encourage you just step out. Come take me by the hand and say, Brother Tracy, I don't know where I'll spend eternity. Jesus Christ is not my Lord and Savior, and I want to make him that. Why do I encourage you to make a public decision like that? Because nobody came to Jesus privately to be saved. Jesus said, Whosoever confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning for decisions to be made. Lord, there are people right here, right now, who already know, Lord God, what they need to do to get their life on track with you. There are people listening to me right now, Lord God, whether they're here in this building or whether they're tuned in for our, through our live feed, Lord. They know that they are on the wrong track. So I pray, Lord God, that you would just give them the power, give them Give them the ability, Lord God, to turn their life over to you. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. We sing our closing hymn, I Surrender All. And I hope that is your prayer.